in continuing to speak about uh, quantum mechanics here, or quantum and nuclear physics, the next uh, topic I want to talk about is the wave nature of matter. Now before we were looking at how light can behave as either a particle or a wave, and uh, the question might be, can matter, you know, something with mass, can it also behave as a wave? We know that mass behaves as a particle already. And the question is, uh, you know, can it behave as a wave? And the answer, of course, is yes. So we can actually talk about something very, very strange. Oops, I better make sure my writing is clear. So uh, we can talk about something really, really strange, which is wavelength of something that has matter. So this is the de Broglie hypothesis. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it uh, wrong, but uh, in any case, I can look it up in our equation booklet. Remember again, we can uh, go look it up here. We've already talked about these first three equations. So the fourth one is P equals H over lambda. So I'll write that down. Maybe I should do it in red instead. P equals h over lambda. Nice, really important equation. So P is the momentum. Just like you've normally thought of momentum, and uh, hopefully you know that momentum is measured in kilogram meters uh, per second. So kilogram meters second to the minus one here. And of course, we've got uh, h, which is your good old Powell Planck's constant. We've been working with that one before. So it's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And we've got lambda, which is the wavelength. And wavelength is measured in meters. So if you look at this, then this tells us about momentum and wavelength. Now, this works for light. So that means this is something really strange that light, which has a wavelength, turns out light has a momentum as well. A lot of people think, well, light doesn't have mass, so how can it have momentum? And well, this is how. That's because uh, light itself, although it's massless, that means P equals MV, well, that gives you zero because it doesn't have a mass. But in this case, light can actually be uh, used in this way. So light has a momentum, which means it can deposit a force. And that's kind of cool because uh, if you talk about uh, light and what you can actually do with it, you can actually take light and have it hold up stuff. Or you can use all sorts of different examples, like uh, I read about you know, solar sails. So for example, this is the sun here. Uh, so let's say this is the sun, and we have you know, sunlight coming from it. If you could actually design some sort of big, giant, ridiculously light uh, sail, so to speak, and you could sort of sit in your spaceship, maybe over here, or maybe you'd put yourself over here instead. That maybe makes more sense. But depending on where you sit yourself, the light itself could actually deposit uh, momentum onto this sort of sail here. And that means then you could end up actually flying to the right. So that's really strange. Of course, making a solar sail is a really strange idea, and they haven't actually uh, had much luck with making them because you have to make them really light. But oh well, that's a neat idea. But you can also use this idea for matter. So you can actually use de Broglie hypothesis for matter. And the strange thing is that that means that you yourself, since you have mass, you know, if you're moving, if you have a momentum, then we can find your wavelength. In other words, something with matter actually has a wavelength, which I think is really awesome. I think it's uh, really quite interesting. Um, now we can also talk about uh, how we can verify uh, this. So this is an experiment that the IB wants you to learn about. It's called the davison germer experiment. And it's a pretty simple, straightforward idea. They actually shot uh, electrons, which is something with matter, and they were shooting them at something that uh, I think it was a nickel crystal. And what happened then is this nickel crystal, these electrons that were being shot at it, they ended up bouncing back and they were scattering. So they were going off at different angles. And it turned out that, um, I mean, that was fully expected. But when they actually looked at the equations and uh, tried to calculate you know, how much this right here should happen, it turns out matter should act as a wave, which means matter should diffract. And that means you can have uh, electrons doing really strange diffraction patterns. So like we were talking about before, you know, where you can send matter through some little slit or some little hole. You know, you can send matter through some sort of hole here. Turns out you won't just get, you know, dots where the matter actually ended up hitting. It'll do just like light did. You'll actually have diffraction patterns. In other words, these spots here where you'll have some of it here. So matter had to act as a wave. So I think it's actually pretty interesting. Now we also have the uses for wavelength of matter. We can actually talk about those as well. So if you're trying to actually find a reason for using this, um, you could say that, um, oh, actually, wait a second. I should probably explain what this actually told us. This Davis and Germer experiment, uh, what actually happened here is that 
So yeah, they actually saw a diffraction pattern here. Okay, so here they saw some diffraction pattern. Here, in other words, if you put a screen here, you ended up with spots a little bit like this right here. I just wanted to make sure that was really clear. So back to the wavelength of the matter here. If we're doing that, the idea could be, what if we're trying to image uh, something like an atom? Well, the size of an atom, I mean, uh, very roughly, the size of the whole diameter of the atom is around 10 to the minus 10 meters. Of course, you want to look at the nucleus, it's much smaller. I think it's on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters. But uh, let's just say we want to see the whole size of the atom. Or if you're going to use light to do it, let's say you had red light. Maybe that's around 600 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. So it turns out this right here is actually way too big compared to this. I mean, you'd think that wavelength of light is actually really small, but it turns out it's not that small. It's actually quite big, especially when compared to the size of an atom, which means that you could never actually image something as small as an atom using visible light uh, because you'd be limited by diffraction. So diffraction would mess things up basically so much to where you couldn't really see the atom. But if you used electrons, for example, they have a much smaller wavelength. And this is really cool. And the reason it is is because then you can use, instead of shooting light at something to try to take a picture, so to speak, you could actually use electrons. And through a not quite so simple idea, but uh, the physics is uh, similar, is that because uh, you can find the wavelength of an electron by this equation here, if you know the momentum of the electron, you can find its wavelength. It turns out its wavelength is somewhere on the order to where you can start imaging or doing neat things with atoms. And uh, you can actually start uh, seeing things that are really ridiculously small, and you can start seeing really good details. So for example, uh, here's a picture that I found. Um, this is online, of course. And when I found this picture right here, they talk about, uh, it looks really creepy. I personally don't like spiders. But this is actually a really close up picture of a spider using an electron microscope. So you can see how you can take really ridiculously detailed shots. I mean, you can see each of its little creepy little hairs here. I personally think this looks quite scary, but at least you can use these uh, to give you really interesting things. So that's uh, one of the things that you can look at. Now, if we talk about other uses for wavelength of matter, we can actually, I'm just going to talk briefly, quickly, without writing it down, because we'll be doing it in more detail later, um, about what we can actually do with waves. If we talk about the wavelength of something, like you, for example, you have a wavelength, which seems really strange. I think it's, it's really hard to try to imagine your own wavelength. But it uh, turns out uh, one can find it. And because of that, you can actually write an equation for your wave. And in a wave, uh, I mean, we could write an equation, although it's quite complicated. And it's something that we do in a uh, you know, university level quantum mechanics courses. Uh, just to show you, uh, this is actually known as a Schrodinger equation. Although I'm probably saying that wrong too. You'd have to ask a German how to say it. But uh, if we look at this equation, this is what a really, really clever guy wrote. Uh, I remember I took a whole class basically in how to understand this equation and what its solutions are. But it turns out, uh, because this is a way, we can actually write an equation here with this uh, Greek letter. I think it's called uh, uh, Psi. So with this equation right here, it turns out you can write how everything will actually work. You can look at the rest of it here. It's a little bit gross. It's a differential equation, so it's not quite so simple to solve using uh, simple IB uh, math uh, skills, I guess. You need to know a little bit more about differential equations before you can start solving this. But it definitely can be solved in some cases, in special cases. But there's something really interesting about this, though. If you imagine this wave equation still, it's, it's you know, kind of like an equation describing some sort of wavy-looking wave. Turns out that equation, you can do something neat with it. If you look at the amplitude of that wave, so in other words, uh, you know, you take from the middle point and you take, you know, uh, let's say how high it goes or how low it goes, this amplitude squared tells you the probability of finding a particle in a certain area. Uh, so I think that's actually really interesting. So finally, we can do something real with this crazy looking wave equation. You can actually take the amplitude and you square it, and it turns out that tells you the probability of finding the particle at that point. 